the technology likely to have the greatest impact on the next few decades has arrived, and it's not social media, it's not big data, it's not robotics, it's not even AI. And you'll be surprised to learn that it's the underlying technology of digital currencies like Bitcoin. It's called the blockchain. Could we pre-distribute wealth? Could we change the way that wealth gets created in the first place by democratizing wealth creation, engaging more people in the economy, and in ensuring that they got fair compensation? Let me describe five ways that this can be done. Number one. Did you know that 70 percent of the people in the world who have land have a tenuous title to it? So you got a little farm in Honduras. Some dictator comes to power. He says, "I know you got a piece of paper that says you own your farm, but the government computer says my friend owns your farm." This happened on a mass scale in Honduras, and this problem exists everywhere. Hernando de Soto, the great Latin American economist, says this is the number one issue in the world in terms of economic mobility, more important than having a bank account, because if you don't have a valid title to your land, you can't borrow against it, and you can't plan for the future. So today, companies are working with governments to put land titles on a blockchain, and once it's there, this is immutable. You can't hack it. This creates the conditions for prosperity. For potentially billions of people. Secondly, a lot of writers talk about Uber and Airbnb and TaskRabbit and Lyft and so on as part of the sharing economy. This is a very powerful idea that peers can come together and create and share wealth. My view is that these companies are not really sharing. In fact, they're successful precisely because they don't share. They aggregate services together and they sell them. What if, rather than Airbnb being a 25 billion dollar corporation, there was a distributed application on a blockchain? We'll call it B Airbnb, and、uh, it was essentially owned by all of the people who have a room to rent. And when someone wants to rent a room, they go onto the blockchain database and. All the criteria、uh, sift through, help them find the right room, and then the blockchain helps with the contracting. It identifies the party. It handles the payments just through digital payments. They're built into the system, and it even handles reputation because if she、uh, uh, rates a room as a five-star room, that room is there and it's rated and it's immutable. So, the big sharing economy disruptors in Silicon Valley. Could be disrupted, and this would be good for prosperity. Number three, the biggest flow of funds from the developed world to the developing world is not corporate investment, and it's not even foreign aid. It's remittances. This is the global diaspora: people who've left their ancestral lands, and they're giving, sending money back to their families at home. This is $600 billion a year, and it's growing. And these people are getting ripped off. Annalee Domingo is a housekeeper, and she lives in Toronto. And every month, she goes to the Western Union office with some cash to send her remittances to her mom in Manila. It costs her around 10 percent. The money takes four to seven days to get there. Her mom never knows when it's going to arrive.、It、takes five hours out of her week to do this. Six months ago, Annalee Domingo used a blockchain application called、um, Abra, and from her mobile device, she said 300 bucks went directly to her mom's mobile device without going through an intermediary. And then her mom looked at her mobile device, and it's kind of like an Uber interface. There's Abra tellers moving around. She clicks on a teller that's a five-star teller who's seven minutes away. The guy shows up at the door, gives her Filipino peso, she puts them in her wallet. The whole thing took minutes, and it cost her two percent. This is a big opportunity for prosperity. Number four, the most powerful asset of the digital age is data, and data is really a new asset class, maybe bigger than previous asset classes like land under the agrarian economy or an industrial plant or even money. And all of you, we create this data. We create this asset. 
and we leave this trail of digital crumbs behind us as we go throughout life, and these crumbs are collected into a mirror image of you, the virtual you. And the virtual you may know more about you than you do, because you can't remember what you bought a year ago, or said a year ago, or your exact location a year ago. And the virtual you is not owned by you. That's the big problem. So today, there are companies working to create a identity in a black box. The virtual you owned by you, and this. Black box moves around with you as you travel throughout the world, and it's very, very stingy. It only gives away the shred of information that's required to do something. A lot of transactions, the seller doesn't even need to know who you are; they just need to know that they got paid. And then this avatar is sweeping up all this data and enabling you to monetize it. And this is a wonderful thing because it can also help us protect our privacy. And privacy is the foundation of a free society. Let's get this asset that we create back under our control, where we can own our own identity and manage it responsibly. Finally, <laughs> finally, number five, there are a whole number of creators of content who don't receive fair compensation. Because the system for intellectual property is broken, it was broken by the first era of the internet. Take music. Musicians are left with crumbs at the end of the whole food chain. You know, if you were a, a songwriter 25 years ago, you wrote a, a hit song. It got a million singles. You could get royalties of around forty-five thousand dollars. Today, you're a songwriter. You write a hit song. It gets a million screams. You don't get forty-five k. You get thirty-six dollars, enough to buy a nice pizza. So Imogen Heap, the Grammy-winning singer-songwriter, is now putting music on a blockchain ecosystem. She calls it Mycelium, and the music has a smart contract surrounding it, and the music protects her intellectual property rights. You want to listen to the song? It's free, or maybe it's a few microcents flow into a digital account. You want to put the song in your movie? That's different, and the IP rights are all specified. You want to make a ringtone? That's different. She describes that the song becomes a business. It's out there on this platform, marketing itself, protecting the rights of the author, and because the song is a payment system in a sense, a bank account, all the money flows back to the artist, and they control. The industry, rather than these powerful intermediaries. Now, this is <laughs> this is not just songwriters. It's any creator of content, like art,、um, like、uh, inventions, scientific discoveries, journalists. There are all kinds of people who don't get fair compensation. And with blockchains, they're going to be able to make it rain on the blockchain, and that's a wonderful thing. So, these are five opportunities of, out of a dozen to solve one problem: prosperity, which is one of countless problems that blockchains are applicable to. Now, technology doesn't create prosperity, of course; people do. But my case to you is that once again, the technology genie has escaped from the bottle, and it was summoned by an unknown person or persons. At this uncertain time in human history, and it's giving us another kick at the can, another opportunity to rewrite the economic power grid and the old order of things, and to solve some of the world's most、uh, difficult problems, if we will it. Thank you.